It's been more than a century since the invention of the light bulb, yet most of the African continent continues to be in the dark at nightfall. Rolling blackouts and an unpredictable energy supply are some of the challenges facing the sector right now. Today we aim to shed some light on Africa's energy story. A widely seen image, but this, however, is not just a snapshot of the world at night, but a geographical representation showing economic activity, where sub-Saharan Africa is largely void of illuminated cities. According to the UN, over 600 million Africans do not have access to electricity power and mostly rely on biomass, namely wood, coal and charcoal. With just under 11 billion US dollars spent on low quality fuel based lighting by sub Saharan countries. With 15 years of experience in the renewable energy industry, Harness Fall knows the grave social costs associated with inefficient energy resources. The World Health Organization did a study where they found that 2 million people per year die from lung infections and lung diseases from smoke inhalation. That's mostly because they cook indoors and they inhale those smoke, the smoke and the, the fumes from paraffin lamps, etc., etc. On average, an African manufacturer in the informal sector may lose as much as 6% of revenue sales from an interrupted power supply, and where power generation is limited, it can climb to as much as a 20% revenue loss. The estimated economic cost of load shedding is equivalent to a 2.1% of GDP. However, power shortages have brought a number of new projects to the fore, with large multinational companies establishing and growing a presence, particularly as natural gas discoveries have made combined cycle plants competitive. Over the last 10 years, common trends in most African countries have been privatisation and restructuring of government-owned power companies. Ultimately, somebody needs to pay. How should that be handled? Should bonds be issued and, and, you know, and the cost shared by a broader society? These are the questions um, and the issues that we expect to emerge from this process. And really, the end goal is to figure out how we can accelerate investments in these projects. So it's not as easy as saying, this is the bill, right? This is how much it costs. but why isn't it flowing? Regular and consistent power supply will do much to attract foreign investment and entice international companies to establish operations in Africa. However, if limited power capacity, high electricity tariffs and instability in the political environment continue to plague Africa's energy sector, this may very well pull the plug on Africa's growth story. But there is light at the end of the tunnel with the persistent call for sustained energy production getting louder. Environmental considerations are also becoming of increasing concern to the industry as government brings environmental policies into line with those of the rest of the world. Joining me in the studio to take a closer look at the state of power on the continent is Paul Eardley Taylor, head of oil and gas, Standard Bank, Jean Mazongwe, she's energy specialist from the DBSA, and Klaus Fint, he's CEO of Global Infrastructure at KPMG. Thank you all for joining me. In terms of the debate and power on the African continent, firstly, can I start with the clean power aspect? Can we hope to follow the developed world when we are an emerging continent? I know this is a, a big question, deserves a big answer, but Paul, perhaps I can throw this to you in the beginning. Yeah, sure. I think there's a couple of things that are relevant in the African space at the moment. Um, I think the first thing on the renewable side is as uh, renewable technology has got more mature in many of the places, the costs have come down. Um, with the structural um, the scale of African power prices in many countries, especially those dependent on diesel, and many alternative energy options, for example, photovoltaic solar, are becoming more and more competitive by the day. Um, I second think the second issue that's relevant is the discovery of hydrocarbons in many African countries, um, offshore Mozambique, offshore Tanzania, possibility of Kenya, um, expanded production in Angola, and it's, it's highly likely that um, cheap natural gas um, will also help um, regenerate and revitalize the African power sector over the next few years. Do you believe that cheap natural gas is going to revitalize the energy sector on the African continent in the next couple of years? You allude to Mozambique and of course that is a hot spot right now in terms of, of gas discovery. Yes, definitely. I think in Mozambique it will have got a major future aspect in Mozambique because 
very big times. But however, coming back to the renewable side, what the African countries, uh, countries also need is base load power. And the renewable like photovoltaic does not really allow for base load power. So therefore, coming back to your initial question, I believe, yes, renewables has to play the role, but we need also thermal power like coal power plants in the African continent. And these are the resources which are there and must be also utilized. Gina, is this the Achilles heel of the African continent? Well, Energy I disruption. Well, I think that we actually have an uh, opportunity here. We, we have a region that's got an abundance of both thermal energy resources as well as hydro potential. And I think what we should be looking at really mm -hmm. is to try and take advantage and exploit the hydro potential. There's a huge hydro potential that's not been exploited, um, particularly um, as we look at the Southern African region, SADAC region, which is the uh, area that the DBSA tends to focus on in the region. Um, hydro, large hydro potential uh, in countries in Angola, in Mozambique, in uh, DRC Congo. And I think it's a question of, of getting all those hydroelectric projects developed up there. A lot of them have had preliminary work that's been done on them. There's uh, studies that have taken place on those projects. Uh, it's, it's, it's about developing them. And um, as, as, as mentioned before, you need a mix. You need a mix because you need base load power to, to meet the, the daily uh, demands of power. And then you can bring in your renewables, your smaller um, IPP projects and uh, smaller solar projects to meet the uh, peaking power. As Jean says, hydropower, big focus for the DBSA. Are those hydro projects lagging other projects on the continent when it comes to energy? No, the hydropower projects have got their own challenge because you have got a very huge initial capex requirement for this. But when you look at, we have got existing one, it's Corabasa or also Coriva North in Zambia or Coriva South for Zimbabwe, where just the uh, expansion of these projects is going on. Saying this also, when you look at Inga, for example, in, uh, you mentioned in DRC, in DRC mm -hmm. where we have got the potential at one spot of 45 gigawatt, which is compared to the, uh, the consumption in South Africa currently 40 gigawatt, it will lighten up the whole continent. However, it always comes down and is discussed for the last 40, 50 years to make it a um, a structure into a commercial viable project and then these challenges around African countries come into the play to the game. High capex in the hydro space what are we looking for when it comes to typical funding models around energy around oil and gas that those areas that you play in? I think the the start point on the funding model um, debate and we're, we're obviously aware of the debate is whether the individual project is targeted at a domestic audience or whether it sells its product internationally. Um, if it has an internationally tradable commodity, for example a mining product, oil and gas, um, it tends to be able to raise more capital over long tenors um, and is able to sort of pierce the country ceiling in, in the industry jargon. Um, whereas if it's focused on a domestic audience, you know, classically electricity project of, of any technology, um, the, the ability to raise funds is typically capped by the, the liquidity and the savings with an individual country and then on top of that by its ability to borrow from, from other countries. Um, so I suspect one of the, the things we'll see over the next few years is there'll be uh, lots of debate and discussion in countries such as Mozambique and Tanzania as to how best to um, monetize the natural resources, how much of it will be used domestically and how much of it will be sold abroad in the form of liquefied natural gas or petrochemicals. And typically uh, this is formed, uh, the debate is sort of formed and shaped uh, through what's known as a natural gas plan and there's lots of debate before that gets settled. Klaus, who is throwing money at the energy problem on the continent? I just came back last week from Beijing and the Chinese are definitely pulling money into the African continent, always driven also by the resources, but also EPC contractors like Sino Hydro, CMEC, Gejuba, they're very interested and they also attract export funding from China in this regard. So what's missing from other parts, even if the DBSA is playing a, a very important role in this part, but also they can on their balance sheet not fund one billion restaurants, neither standard bank. So you need the combination of export credit insurance from other countries, and that China is very attractive at this point in time, to get these projects up and running. And it's very important, these projects are structured on a commercial basis, and therefore, even if it's in domestic market, if it's in Mozambique or Zimbabwe or South Africa, they all compete about the same off-ticker, because you need long-term US dollar predictable power purchase agreements to make this happen, and therefore you're in a competitive situation also. Jean, where's the support coming from in this space? You're on the ground there, you're spending a lot of money in the energy environment and building infrastructure. Okay. Are you getting support? Absolutely. Um, long Power projects tend to be uh, long-term in gestation because there's a, a long period to prepare and develop. So you tend to find there's a 
uh, a different group of players that will come in to support the development of that project. We rely uh, a lot on having a good, strong uh, sponsor with the uh, equity to put into the project, uh, as well as for the long-term concessionary debt funding that's normally provided by development finance institutions like ourselves, the African Development Bank, the World Bank. They're all playing in that space. These are, uh, these are institutions that have been in the power sector for a very, very, very long time. And uh, with the region opening up a lot to uh, IPP development, we find that a lot of private players are coming into that space as well. But they have to be patient because it's, it's really long term, as I've mentioned earlier. So the returns may be longer. Paul Klaas mentioned the, the Chinese. Obviously, that money is forthcoming. Are we past bashing the Chinese? Do we celebrate their play on the continent, specifically in the energy space? I think what's most interesting about Africa really is the number of different liquidity pools that target the continent. Um, perhaps there's a slightly different uh, liquidity pool set for power, uh, but certainly in oil and gas you'll see um, the involvement of, of Western investors, um, listed companies, uh, just as much as the, the new sovereign wealth funds. Um, and it isn't just the Chinese who are looking quite actively at Africa. Um, you also have um, Indian oil companies, for example, or most notably at the moment there's a takeover battle between the Thais and Shells for a, for a minority stake in the major gas fields off offshore of Mozambique. So I think what really comes through is the, the scale of the resources that are um, there to be um, taken out of the ground and, and paid an economic price for in Africa is really attracting every major liquidity pool, not just China but elsewhere. Is this the biggest hotspot on, on the African continent, class? The power. The power. Definitely. Energy. We've got around about 1 billion people. It will go up by nine in the next 40 years to 2 billion people. And as you have got in your trailer, we've got only an electrification rate of 20 to 30 percent. So we're lacking behind, and it's, it's, it will drive all the other industries. And uh, it's, therefore, it's very important. It's the highest on the priorities, definitely. And Jean, let's just get your final comments uh, on the power. Yes. Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, the other driver for that is also the uh, rate of industrial growth. We're finding a lot of growth in the mining sector uh, as well as in industry. So there's a lot of urbanization as well, which is driving up the electrification rates and the demand for electricity and power. Our electrification rates in the region are very, very low. Um, you find that we are ranging from 6% in some countries to 20 or 30% in some regions. Um, in, in, in the SADAC region in particular. So really there's, there's a high demand and, and, and drivers for, for growth.